Once again, good evening. If you would, you could turn over to the book of First Peter, First Peter chapter three. Uh, for the bulk of our lesson, we're going to be here. We're going to be in a lot of other places uh, as well. But uh, tonight we are continuing kind of our question and answers. I told you we would continue into the new year, uh, still answering those questions. Uh, people ask them. They want uh, to know uh, as best as we can uh, the answer to uh, those questions. So uh, rather than put them off uh, for some other time, we're just going to continue answering uh, them. And I'm kind of combining two questions this evening uh, that have to do with what you might generally call uh, what happens to people um, when they die, uh, when, when they die. Uh, specifically with regard to uh, salvation, the second question we're going to ask is, do people after they die have a second chance uh, at salvation? Uh, and uh, the first question that we're going to ask is spoken uh, with regard to the context of 1 Peter chapter 3, namely verses 18 uh, and 19, uh, which is supposedly, uh, in, in the minds of some, uh, an answer to that latter question that we just asked. Um, it, it's, to give you the short story, it is not, uh, but we are going to examine both of those questions. Um, the first of which very simply is this, where was Jesus for the three days between his death uh, and his resurrection? Uh, I mean, he died on the cross, right? I mean, his fleshly uh, body was, uh, you know, sloughed off. Uh, it was put in a tomb and, you know, three days later, uh, it was gone. Uh, it, it was gone. But what happened to Jesus uh, during that three-day period? Uh, where did he go? Now, now, there are several places that we can go in Scripture to kind of figure out uh, exactly where uh, he went. But we're going to go ahead and start here uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, and I want to get a little bit of the context. So I want to go back to about verse 14. Okay? Peter, of course, is writing, and he says this. <clears throat> but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile, uh, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that... <clears throat> if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And then he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to spirits uh, in prison, because the formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. And he goes on a little bit about that. Now, the baptism corresponds, now saves you. We get that part. I think most of us understand everything but from verse 14 down through about the middle of verse 18. Uh, and then things get a little bit crazy. Um, we have a lot of questions, and, and it, it, there's no mistaking that this is a, a, a set of scriptures that, that does pose some unique problems. I mean, what does it mean here when it says that <clears throat> he went and proclaimed to the spirits uh, in prison? Now, right off the bat, we'll tell you that uh, a lot of people uh, have asked this question because a lot of people have been taught, um, maybe for the entirety of their life, that when Jesus died on the cross, he died on the cross, his, his flesh went to the tomb, uh, his spirit then uh, went into <clears throat> what you would call the unseen realm of the dead. Some would say that he went to hell. Uh, he actually went to hell, that Gehenna hell that's kind of reserved uh, for those who, you know, know not God uh, and don't do God's will for Satan and his angels, as would Christ would preach in Matthew chapter 25. He went there uh, and he preached again the gospel message to those who had been resigned uh, there. Uh, and by means of doing that, or because he did that, he gives them a second chance to have the salvation uh, that um, <clears throat> you know, he offered through his sacrifice on uh, the cross. Now, the big problem with all of that is that the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. 
the Bible never says that. As a matter of fact, you, you can go through the entirety of the New Testament. And while the New Testament does re- refer to us in kind of, uh, you know, by implication as spiritual beings or as having souls or, or as people who have spirits, we are to do things, for instance, worship in spirit uh, and in truth. There's never a place in the New Testament where the souls of human beings are referred to as spirits. Does that make sense? You can't find it. Not, in the same, not using the same verbiage that he uses here. Now, you can go down a little bit, uh, and you can look in um, verse 20. <clears throat> it says, because, the former, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being uh, prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons. Now, does anybody's Bible read eight souls? Eight souls? Okay, yeah, that's probably, probably King James or New King James, something along that line. Uh, different word, uh, different word being used here, and that is a reference to human beings, the souls of human beings. Uh, so he's not talking about, <clears throat> he went and he preached to, you know, human beings that were resigned to hell. Not only that, he never says uh, that he went to hell. As a matter of fact, we, we have other contexts that tell us something very much uh, to the contrary. Turn over to Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> and this one doesn't really give us kind of a location or place description, uh, but 23 verse 46. Chapter 23 verse 46. And Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed uh, his last. Uh, He dies, uh, but where his spirit was going is described here uh, as into the hands of the Father. Into the hands of the Father. Uh, Which, I don't know that we would describe that as hell. uh, As as hell. Um, You can go, for instance, over to, excuse me, Acts, the book of Acts in chapter 2, and verse 31, but let's start reading at verse 30. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, the word Hades here uh, can be used in a couple of different senses, but it is never used uh, with reference to that hell, that Gehenna uh, hell, that is the final kind of resting place of all of those who have not done the will of God, Satan, his angels, and all those we've mentioned so far. It's different. It can be either used uh, to indicate the grave, or it means the unseen realm of the dead. And from the overall picture that we can get in the New Testament uh, of what this realm looks like, um, you have this unseen realm of the dead, and it is divided into at least three parts. You have the place that Christ told the thief on the cross about, tonight you will be with me in paradise. That, that's, the same pla- <clears throat> that's the same place that Lazarus and the story of rich man and Lazarus, that's the same place he goes to, only there uh, it is referred to uh, as the bosom of Abraham. And he is in bliss. He is in bliss. Now, there's a great gulf there between that place uh, and the place where the rich man ends up. Where we're told that he is in torment. He is in torment. Uh, and um, that's, what the, that's what this realm looks like. Hades is a word that is often used to describe uh, this realm as a whole. But it never specifically says, and certainly Peter does not say in 1 Peter 3, uh, 18 and 19, uh, that uh, Christ went to, it doesn't even say Hades, it just said he went to the spirits in prison, went to the spirits in in prison, uh, and he proclaimed to them. Now it's worth pointing out that the word here, proclaimed, is the word that we would use for uh, herald, uh, to herald something. Uh, A herald was a person who would go before a king. Uh, and would announce that the king is coming, and here's the message uh, of the king. 
Um, that's the word that is used here. Sometimes uh, it's a word used. It's not often used, but sometimes it's used uh, to describe what we would call um, preaching, what we would call preaching. Uh, the word prison here is just bondage. It just means uh, to be held uh, in bondage. So Christ is going to these spirits, not human souls, that are in some place held in bondage, and he is proclaiming to them some kind of message. All clear? No, not really. We don't know what message he proclaimed, right? But if I had to guess, and this is just a guess, if I had to guess, he would be proclaiming victory. These spirits are probably the principalities and powers that worked against him. That worked against him. And he goes there and he proclaims to them victory. See, if he is in the unseen realm of the dead, then, <clears throat> then uh, he can proclaim to them victory. Likewise, he could be going to proclaim to, uh, to you know, others, those fallen angels perhaps. Uh, if you go over to Jude, he mentions those. Uh, we're not exactly sure. We're not exactly sure what he is proclaiming. Um, but we do know he went and he did proclaim something. Uh, but one other thing we know for sure is that this place is it's not hell as we would know it. And it's certainly not him giving these people a second chance. A second chance. Um, that's not what this is. So we can't really go there and, and teach that. A lot of people do, um, but it's not appropriate. Uh, you know, you do have certain doctrines <clears throat> that are taught along this line. Uh, for instance, anybody ever heard of purgatory? Purgatory is pretty much a predominantly Catholic thing, um, and it's been handed down by tradition uh, as part of the teaching of the church, which is perceived uh, in Catholicism as being authoritative. Um, but it's not within Scripture. Uh, you, you never find uh, purgatory uh, mentioned in the Bible at all. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with purgatory, uh, just to kind of give you the, the, the loose uh, version of it, purgatory is a place where, uh, you know, you, you go uh, and you suffer for a bit, but you can escape from purgatory and go on to that paradise or what we would call, you know, heaven in eternity. Purgatory is a built-in doctrine that says Everybody will have a chance to make it to heaven even after you die, even after you die. Uh, and of course, we mentioned it in subsequent or earlier lessons, I should say, um, that <clears throat> it was a doctrine that was taught by the church, um, and they used it uh, to help fund the church, uh, help fund the church. Uh, you know, if you would pay indulgences, then, you know, your loved ones would spend less time in purgatory uh, and more time, you, you know, in, in eternity. Uh, those days are gone, and, you know, the Catholic Church hasn't done that for, you know, years. But as far as I know, they still hold on, <clears throat> they still hold on to that doctrine of uh, purgatory. But you can't base an entire doctrine. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine sending somebody into eternity, telling them, hey, you're going to have a second chance there. You know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to change anything here and now. You're going to have a second chance there. Well, how do you know? Well, cause Jesus went and he preached to the spirits in prison. Well, who are the spirits in prison? Well, we don't know, but we know you're going to be, you know, having that second chance. doesn't make any sense. That would be a scary proposition, uh, you know. While we don't understand it, we certainly can't base doctrine around it. So that leads us to the, the second and the predominant question. Do people get a second chance? Well, the answer, simple one, is yes, they do. Yes, they do. Not after they're dead, but they do get second chances. As a matter of fact, how many of us here have had more than two chances? We've all had more than two chances. As a matter of fact, every moment that ticks by is another chance for you to do something to become better spiritually, to get rid of problems. You can think about it for a minute. If all men sin and fall short of the glory of God, then all men constantly need to be evaluating, 
need to be repenting, confessing faults to one, one to another, uh, and doing those good works that were designed for us before the foundation of the world. That's what God tells us, right? You know, we need to constantly be doing that. Uh, so all along the way, every time we sin and God allows us to say, please forgive me, you just got another chance. You just got another chance. Uh, so this whole thing about second chances, and we all get thousands of chances, if not more, in, in a lifetime. In a lifetime. We no doubt have more chances in a single day than a lot of people like to, to think about. You know, so why people kind of push this into eternity uh, is, is beyond me. God tells us. It's here and now. And there are several places you can go in the Bible to kind of emphasize this to folks. There's not going to be a chance once you die. It is appointed unto men once to die. After that, what? The judgment. The judgment. That's what Paul writes in the book of Hebrews. Trying to warn them against going back. Going back to that, that old law. Having, you know, tasted the word. Having lived in the enlightenment of, of God and embracing his son. To go back to trample the, the, the son of God afresh. To crucify him again would be a heinous thing to do. So he warns them. He warns them. He tells them, look, right now you've got a chance. Right now you have a chance. But it's appointed unto men wants to die. After that, it's only judgment. There's only judgment. And your destination is going to be fixed. Another place you can go to is, you know, the, um, the foolish virgins. We all know how the story goes, right? We have these, you know, virgins, ten of them, five wise, five unwise. Uh, they're going to, you know, <clears throat> they're going to uh, the, the, the wedding feast. Uh, and, uh, of course, the bridegroom tarries. Uh, some of them came prepared with extra oil. Some of them did not. Uh, and uh, it gets late and, you know, the five leave, right? They leave to go get oil because they don't want to be without when, when the bridegroom shows up. And then the end of the story is what? They come back and what do they face? What do they get? Come on in. No, they're not welcome, right? The door's shut. The time has passed. You see, there is an opportune moment to act. God has given us this lifetime uh, to act uh, and to, you know, secure uh, our salvation. So you go back again to, to Luke chapter 16. And you look at that scenario where, well, I'll tell you what, let's just go there and read. This is the third of our context, and then we're going to talk about some ideas that are within Scripture. But if you go to Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19, <clears throat> you read that story of the rich man and, uh, you know, Lazarus. Um, but I want you to, to kind of read just a couple of verses uh, with me. Verse uh, 25 of the chapter. He says, but Abraham said, child, <clears throat> but Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here uh, to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. In other words, your destination's fixed. That There is nothing that Lazarus can do. There is nothing that I can do that that is going to help you out of your situation the great gulf is fixed in between you know when you live your life as if it's you know the only thing you've got and that there is no eternity and you'll never stand in the day of judgment then you end up like this rich man in the story but not so with Lazarus he, he lived a different life. He lived a different life. He lived a life that was, you know, opposed, supposedly full of righteousness. He is now comforted. Didn't have much in life. Suffered a lot. But now he's receiving that reward. If there's a second chance, then a lot of other passages in the Bible don't make sense. 
Matthew 25, that great scene where you have sheep and goats and all of that, and they're divided, and you know, some uh, you, you know, are going to enter in, and some are going to be held outside that door. It doesn't make any sense. You know, if everybody's just going to get a second chance, then why divvy people up? You know, why divvy people up uh, into these two groups if we're all just going to end up going into, uh, into heaven, you know, anyhow? Uh, if everybody goes to heaven, we're just all getting there by different paths, then why sheeps and goats? You know, why not sheep and goat and llama and giraffe and hippo and, you know, naked mole rat? You know, I don't know. I mean, whatever you want to pick, you know, pick something, right? Because it doesn't really matter. And they're not going to, there is no pit there is no weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is no smoke rising up for forever and ever. Because, see, everybody's going to get a second chance. That's not what the Bible teaches. Turn over with me to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20. And we're just going to begin at verse 11. Read through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence, <clears throat> from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up uh, the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one uh, of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, you'll notice there are two things that are repeated a couple of times. The first one is this, found at the end of verse 12 and found at the end of verse 13. They were judged according to what they had done. Verse 13, according to what they had done. And then repeated too is this lake of fire where those who did not do well are cast. So there is this judgment that takes place. This judgment that takes place uh, and there's a dividing out once more here in the book of Revelation. Just like Christ said back in Matthew chapter 25. It's a judgment scene, and it takes place after we die. No, way, no place in this story, just like there's no place in the story of Lazarus, just like there's no place in Matthew 25, just like there's no place in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn over there, just real quick. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 8, he says, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. No second chance after death there either. We die, there's a judgment. That judgment comes down to good or evil. And it's all going to be in this book. Now, why would God even keep books if it just didn't matter? Why would he keep a book? Why would he write down? And again, are there literal books made of literal paper? No, it's a spiritual realm. There aren't physical books there. It's simply a metaphor. Your life is known. Your life is like a book. And that book is going to be opened and it will be read. We know your deeds. We know your works. Make sure they're good. So you can come and have that place in eternity with him. Go over to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're going to begin at verse 5. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with afflictions those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you 
who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance or inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. So where's that second chance? Where's that second chance after we have lived the fullness of our lives here? Very simply, there isn't one. It's never taught within Old Testament Scripture. It's never taught within New Testament Scripture. Christ didn't go to hell and preach to people who had died so that they could repent of their sins and come to know him and embrace him and, you know, live for eternity. As a matter of fact, the only time that that's ever suggested, and we're going to go back to Luke chapter 16, and then the lesson will have to be yours. But Luke chapter 16, the the only place that you ever come close uh, to, to anything like this is a request that's made by the rich man. Request that's made by the rich man. Verse 27. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but, it is someone, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And, and then notice this last verse. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You know, why would we ever think that they w- people would embrace it even after they die, maybe being in torments, well, sure, they, they want to come on out, but they don't know anything of Christ. They don't know anything of righteousness. How would they embrace those things? How would they embrace the, the, the good works? How would they embrace those things that they were supposed to have done prior to the time they died? It's an impossibility, just like it was impossible for them to send somebody back to raised from the dead so the brothers would believe. So are there there second chances? Sure. While you're alive. Many, many chances. And we ought to embrace every single one of them. Second chances to do good works. Second chances to have opportunities to to impact people's lives. Second chances to get rid of our own sin. Second chances to get better and grow and be more spiritually disciplined. Second chances to be faithful in attendance. Second chances to be, you know, a better husband, a better wife, a better child, a better whatever. We have all of those while we are alive. After that, our eternity is fixed according to New Testament teaching. Whether we're talking about the parables of the Christ, the writings of Paul, or John the Revelator. From the beginning of the New Testament to the end. It tells us, It is appointed unto men once to die. After that, the judgment. So, tonight, are we in need of one of those second chances? Maybe we haven't even embraced the first chance. Maybe we're here tonight, or you're here tonight, and you've heard God's word. Do you believe? Have you repented of your sins? Confessed the name of Christ? Given yourself to him in baptism? Letting him wash you clean? If you're here tonight and you have any need, we encourage you to make it known now while we stand and sing.